So this last problem, we could finish it off. It's getting kind of ugly because next step would be find the magnitude, and then n is, let's see, wait, I didn't even, that is t prime, is that right? Yeah. So the next step would be find t prime magnitude and divide by the magnitude. So that would take quite a while. So we're not going to do it on this problem. But I think the next one is designed to work out a little better. So we'll do that. I want to know uh, t and n. And kappa, the curvature. This is really similar to one that we already did. The only difference is this is in three dimensions and there is a uh, not zero or non-zero z coordinate. So there will be one t value where it's zero, but overall it will not be a circle spinning around on the xy plane. So before we get started, if this was just in two dimensions, if there was no z coordinate, what would we be looking at? A circle. A circle. So one uh, piece of insight you can get out of this is if you look down the z-axis, you'll see a circle. So if you, by looking down the z-axis, you're basically ignoring z-coordinates. So you're just going to see a circle. What shape is this when we consider it's three-dimensional curve? Square. Not quite a sphere. A spiral. So why is it a spiral? So we already said it's a circle in the x, y plane. <coughs> because it has a z element that causes, as you increase the t values, it'll consistently go up, never meeting itself. Yes, yeah, so if v is positive, it will be the z coordinate will be increasing. If z is negative, the z coordinate will be decreasing. So it's basically drawing a circle while moving up or moving down. So that's a corkscrew or a circular spring, something like that. So that's the shape we're looking at. So before we even do any of the work, what do you think about the acceleration if you're traveling around a spiral? Is it constant? Seems like constant. it should be constant because right. you're always doing the same turn to the middle and going up a little bit. So that's a little bit of insight. So go ahead and figure out the find, I think I wrote them in the right order, T first. You can find K before or after the other ones, but it's probably good to find T and then N and then K, like that. So go ahead and compute them. I'll give you a two minute head start and see if I can get you. You may need to flip back to your cheat sheet or your notes for T and N definitions. <coughs> Velocity over magnitude velocity. Thirteen three. I'm pretty sure I wrote down t in thirteen four as well. So I talked about t in thirteen three, but everything you need is basically thirteen four. In case this way, yes. Yeah, and that's like t prime magnitude basically. Okay. <coughs> Oh, uh, is it that T of T? T is equal to Correct. It's a normalized velocity. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh. That is that. So 
that should be everything you need on the board. That one? Yeah. There are no U's. That's not a U. All my U's have a foot on them. Oh, okay. There also are no U's. I haven't probably used a letter U. All right, it's been a while. Probably since the vector, chapter 12, maybe. Let's make this problem a lot easier and use AT for our Z coordinate. It'll factor out a lot nicer that way. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay. uh, you can factor out, you're probably factoring out an A squared. Yeah. Because uh, <laughs> A, if you brought just brought an A out, it would come out as a square root of A. But you get the A squared out, and that comes out as absolute value of A, technically. But we're going to assume A is greater than zero. Let me know if I made any mistakes <coughs> up there, or if there's any confusion. I'm skipping some steps when I simplify, like I never even wrote cos squared plus sine squared, and I just factored out the a squared, and that's what you see right here in the square root. So I'm skipping pretty much all the trig simplification.
So I did one uh, with the magnitude. I did one property over here, which I did on the wrote on the right side. I just factored out the or just left the scalar outside right there when I took a magnitude. And as long as it's positive, the rule I used is on the right there. You can basically factor a scalar out of the magnitude as long as it's positive. Going from t to t prime, should the t prime y coordinate be negative? Oh no, should it? Yeah. Ah. Negative. And oh, that didn't cause too many problems. It would cause problems in your, what is that? The normalized acceleration would be pointing, uh, have the wrong y coordinate. So that would be bad overall. <coughs> okay, at the very end, uh, I got kappa to be 1 over 2a. And then we know the radius of the turn you would be making would be the reciprocal. So that would be 2a. So if you look back, the let's see the fact that we went upwards while we were spiraling around added basically doubled our turn radius. And if we went upward at a faster rate, our turn radius would be even wider, basically. Uh, I can try to draw a spiral, but it's going to look really ugly. Something like that. Uh, when you think of the turn radius, uh, you can think of kind of a diagonal circle living there. Uh, so if you think of your, your slinky standing straight up, you're going to have a kind of tilted, at any point you'll have a tilted circle. And the radius will be bigger than the kind of internal radius of your slinky because it will be uh, tilted. Actually be tilted on two axes, but anyways, you'll have that circle will be kind of diagonal, which I absolutely cannot draw. So we'll erase it. So that's the end of 13.4. So next we're going to go 13.5. So what we're going to do is basically use the same uh, T and N. So we know our velocity, we know our acceleration. Now the T and the N are basically the direction of your velocity, the direction of your acceleration, because they have nothing to do with magnitude. So we know direction of velocity or movement direction and acceleration direction and they're perpendicular we saw already what would we get if we crossed two vectors that they don't even have to be perpendicular but as long as they're not parallel or anti-parallel what will we get if we cross two vectors we'll get a cross product but will we get an area we could yeah you can use it to get an area of a parallelogram uh, but in terms of geometrically, what does a cross product give you? Vector, so it gives you a perpendicular or orthogonal vector. So that uh, property we're going to be using next. In the next section, we haven't used cross product, I think, since last chapter. So we're about to start using it here. <coughs> so this is what we call a local frame. local frame for a curve, of course, R of t at some value. We'll just use t0. So it's going to be called a t and b frame. So the t and the n you're used to, b is just going to be the cross product of the two. Make sure the order is right. Yep. Uh, cross product is the only product we really, aside from matrix product, that order is really important. So if you cross in the other way, you'll have a, a component going the exact opposite direction. So you want to make sure it's not n cross t, it's t cross n. So this also has another name called the Frenet frame. Why is it called a local frame? Uh, you'll see in a minute. Okay. 
So let's draw the curve and what this looks like. I'll do the curve in blue and I'll draw the frame in the black marker. So we'll just do some easy curve like this. Now when I draw the velocity, I'm going to <coughs> say that this distance will be one right here. So these are all supposed to be units. So that'll be one. We're going to have, what direction is the acceleration going to point? So it's going to be inward. No matter what, without knowing anything about the curve, it needs to be perpendicular. So it better be there. Uh, it's going to point inwards right here. So that's our N, our T. Now when we cross these two, let's use right hand rule one, T is one, N is two. So we're going to have vector coming up or going down. Well, you're looking out at vertical. So out of the page is your cross product vector. So take your right hand, vector one is T, so index finger is T, middle finger points to N, and then your thumb points directly out of the page. So make sure you don't flick people off, <laughs> don't flip them around. So if you flip people off, you are going the wrong direction. That's the negative of what you want to be doing. So make sure you're basically, I don't know what gesture this is. No, it's the right hand rule, so obviously. This is how I prevent. Yeah. <laughs> Use three fingers <laughs> instead of one. The super finger as your second vector. Yes. All right. <laughs> super. Yeah. Frame All right, so B, you can't really draw B because it's going, str it's going directly out of the paper. So what I'm going to do is just pretend that I can draw it. I'll use red for that. It's supposed to be going out of the board. And then we have some perpendicular right there and right there. So the reason they call this a frame, you're basically creating at that point a new x, y, and z axis. It's very likely not the aligned of the x, y, z axis, but it's a new coordinate, a set of coordinate axes that are all perpendicular. So that's why it's called a local frame. In this case, and every case, n and t themselves would be perpendicular? Yep, all three of these vectors would be perpendicular. So n and t are always perpendicular. We saw that as long as you started by with a normalized tan uh, tangent t. So t is not the velocity, it's the normal, it's the direction of the velocity. Okay. So if you just use the velocity, you'll still get two perpendicular. Actually, that's not true anymore. Yeah, if your velocity is changing, your n, like when you're speeding up, your and if this is not, so if we have a curve that is not constant speed and we're looking at the velocity vector v, if we're speeding up, like yes there is, we're turning left, but if we're speeding up, that's your acceleration right there. And if you're slowing down, it's still going inwards, but it's also countering the direction of movement. Does that make sense? So if, if velocity is not changing, your acceleration has to be perpendicular to your direction of travel. Okay. If you're speeding up, there is some component of acceleration going with your velocity. And if you're okay. slowing down, there's some component of acceleration going against your velocity. Okay. Uh, so that's why we just assume velocity is uh, not necessarily constant, but we take the t vector, which, it, which does move at a, uh, <coughs> always has a magnitude of one. So that's what we're doing is not countering the acceleration um, in the movement direction. All right, so there's our B component right there. And we could write down how to compute this. So let's write down our velocity in a different way. So V is dr dt. That's, we knew that before. That was basically a definition, derivative of the position. That's a velocity. And now I'm going to use the chain rule <coughs> right here. And dr ds, that is how the position changes uh, what is the s variable? Speed. So s is basically speed. 
So we want to know how does r change uh, with respect to the speed. And so that right there is uh, the normalized speed, which we call t. And it's times ds dt. You don't have to follow all these steps. I'll just circle what's important at the end, or put a box around what we really need at the end. So this is uh, velocity related to speed and time. So basically, we're looking at this. Here's a unit in the direction, and we're multiplying the unit velocity, or the direction of the velocity, by the actual speed. So we're saying we're traveling this direction. We're not going one mile an hour. Maybe we're going 60 miles an hour. So I'm going to use the unit vector in this direction, multiply it by 60. So it's a, a way to think about your velocity as a direction multiplied by a magnitude, or multiplied by uh, a scalar. So that's velocity. We're going to do the same thing with acceleration. So acceleration is dv over dt. <coughs> and these are, the not the, these are not the normalized versions. These are the regular velocity right here. And now we're going to look at the regular acceleration. We're going to try to rewrite it in terms of n. So I can rewrite this as the t derivative of v, and then we're going to go back to v, one of these versions of v, and substitute it in. And the one we're going to pick is the last one. So I'm going to take that version and substitute it in here. Ooh, I circled the wrong thing. Circle all that stuff. There, the whole thing is V, not just the TSDT. Okay, so from here, what rule do I need to do to find this derivative? It's a little bit tricky. <coughs> I said what was happening in here. What operation is occurring between these two? The time and position of the particle. It's kind of tricky. What type of an object is T? T is the number or vector? Number. Number. Second guess. Vector. Very good. <laughs> All right. Remember, it's the direction your velocity is heading in. So it's a vector. What is the ds dt right next to it? Number or a vector? Number. Number. That's the speed. So this is a scalar times a vector. That's what we're looking at. That would have been your second guess. So we made that sub, and we have a vector. Oh, that's a horrible marker to use. So we have a vector times scalar. Does it make sense to use dot product or scalar? Uh, dot product or cross product no. to describe this product? Not at all. That's just a scalar product right there. So when we move down, we have the same exact thing, t scalar product with the SDT. But now we're about to take a derivative. So all we're really doing is taking the derivative of a, of a vector. Derivative of a vector times a scalar. So we're going to use a product rule. This is a scalar product rule. That's what we're about to use. Good news is it's going to look just like the product rule you're thinking of. So it's t prime <coughs> times regular ds dt plus regular t uh, times ddt of ds dt. So this is basically u prime v plus u v prime. That's all I did right there. One's a scalar, one's a vector. Good news is the product rule works just like it normally does. All right, so now we have this version. Let's look and see how to rewrite it. So I'm going to rewrite t prime as dt dt. Ooh. 
plus and the right side I'm going to rewrite you have basically a t derivative of a t derivative of s that's what you have on the right so I'm going to write it as basically a t derivative squared and there's a few ways to write it I'm going to write it as d squared over dt squared that just means take the derivative twice of s right there That's a double derivative. So we're not going to do anything to the second term. I'm only going to write it as the t derivative squared of s in the front. Uh, scalar multiplication is commutative. So I can switch the order of a vector and a scalar. It's all I did right there. Now the first one is more tricky. Do we need parentheses around the dt? dt. You can. Uh, a lot of people like to do that. Technically, you don't need it because dt is thought of as one single unit. Okay. So it's not, um, it would be very incorrect to write uh, dt times dt equals d dtt. Because they're not, you can't separate them out like that. It's like saying cosine. It's like. Yeah, kind of like that, yeah. Like you can't split up the C from the O and the S and cosine. Yeah. Or at least you certainly shouldn't. <laughs> or like take an absolute value sign to be one or something. <laughs> All right, so the first term is going to be a little bit more complicated. We're going to use an identity. What in the world identity are we going to use? I'll just write the answer and then we'll figure out how we got there. Okay. So I have ds dt whole thing squared times kappa n plus. So if we figured out how kappa was related to n, we could probably figure this one out. So. that kappa 1 over n, it was magnitude of t prime, is that right? Yeah. Over v, yeah, all right, and we're using, so I'm going to write d, uh, t prime as dt dt. So I'm going to solve for dt dt, so k multiplied by magnitude v equals dt dt yeah, absolute value to worry about hmm. can k be negative it, uh, no it comes from basically everything that was uh, had an absolute value, uh, magnitude or an absolute value. Okay. So, so, and we assume v was never going to be zero. So it's always defined and never negative. Okay. So then, can we put absolute values around the whole equation and just be able to manipulate anything within it? Uh, we could do that, but then we'd be finding the magnitude of the acceleration as opposed to the acceleration itself. Okay. So we certainly could if we were concerned about the magnitude of the acceleration. Okay. And that, that may make some things a, a whole lot more simple. Uh, it kind of depends on basically how much information you want about the acceleration. Okay. If I just want the magnitude, I might be able to shortcut a lot of things out. Okay. All right, 
I have an, another identity written down, which is dt over ds equals kn. Why would this be true? Physics always makes my head hurt when you're trying to actually figure out what things really mean. Just quit. Just give up? Yeah, I mean, that's what I do. That's an <laughs> undergrad move. Uh, poor move. That's your attitude. Alright, so what's the last thing I wrote down we believe over here? I think that <laughs> one right there, that's basically that's the definition of kappa. So whether or not you believe it, that's what we defined it to be. So that's definitely true. I didn't actually believe the next thing I wrote down. I think we did a, a geometrical computation with the radius last section. Somewhere I drew a nice, there we go. So the center, all right, we said the radius was one over K, one over kappa. <coughs> it's only 24 Greek letters, I looked it up yesterday. There's not even that many. <laughs> yeah, we got more English letters than they got in Greek alphabet. I don't think that's going to help us necessarily. All right, so I'll just write what's in my notes. And maybe I'll understand it in a minute. So from the principal unit normal, compared to <laughs> I asked my Greek friend a few of them but I can't remember her response to every single letter <laughs> Were they like similar, like yeah I was pretty close uh, but I did not ask about every single letter <laughs> if you do math you need a Greek friend <laughs> Oh, that's one. No, no. Divide by the magnitude. There we go. All right, so why is this true? Oh, if I was a normal math teacher, I'd say it's true because I wrote it on the board. <laughs> and it must be true because I copied it out of a textbook at some point in the past. Somehow we got to turn it. We have to get n into here. Ah, this. So this is the definition of n. The last, the left, and the right. That's the definition of n, right? T prime over magnitude t prime. 
That's the definition of n right there. So I can write n equals. Now the question is, why does it also equal what I just erased? Yeah, I can definitely re. I have k written right above there, and now I have to relate dt to d. I have to relate these two quantities together, and I think we wrote something. Wait, somewhere around here. Ds dt times t equals now oh, dr equals v. wrote my notes five years ago, it all made sense and flowed perfectly. So what the six years? Probably. It's been a long time. Whatever the date on the top of this is, is not that's just the date I wrote the template. Which I think was like a year ago. It's not the day I wrote my notes. Yeah, I don't think, I think they're in the cloud, and I don't not sign to the Wi-Fi right now. Oh. Could also use the textbook. Yeah. Unfortunately, the most useful tool is probably not in the room. Oh, yeah. All right, let's see if oh. you can figure this out then. <laughs> wow. For the first time. You can't physics book too. The alternating series for the world. <laughs> if you plug one, the reciprocal of one over the. I don't want to look at the book. When I was a student, the book was useful. So I'm going to make a substitution right here for the DDT. Is that what you did? You probably made stuff in the book. Maybe I'm going to take out what I circled and substitute in. Uh, so I'm solving for dt dt magnitude. Equals k magnitude v. So I'm going to make that substitution for what I have circled down here. Alright, so what I circled, I just substituted out for k times magnitude v. I probably should circle. That's the one I'm substituting in down there. So that gives us our 1 over k. And now we're left with basically t prime over magnitude v. And that should be dt ds, hopefully, is that. So I think we're going to be using this ds over dt. I just took the identity right there. I'm going to take a magnitude. So we have this. Now I'm going to take a magnitude of both sides. What we're looking at on the right side, t is a vector, and you can split magnitude across a vector times a scalar. Absolutely, you're gonna have to derive everything. You can't use a cheat sheet, all from the definition of derivative. <laughs> Remember all your epsilons and deltas? No, you won't have to derive these. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I get paid the big bucks, <laughs> so I can derive these. All right, so before I <laughs> sub these in, what is this value right there? What is that value? Magnitude of t. It's easy. It's a vector. 
It's a vector. What, what is the magnitude? This is a special vector. It's a location vector. It's the direction of our velocity. So what's this magnitude? One. So we get to cancel it. So magnitude V is ds over dt magnitude. So I'm going to substitute that V out, magnitude of V out, for this ds over dt. And now I'm actually thinking I probably want to write t prime as t, uh, dt dt instead. So it's multiplied by the reciprocal, fractions of fractions, not very fun. Good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now. I want to just cancel these DTs. The, the D little t, not big T. If we do that, I think we're done at that point. Yeah. Want to just cancel them and pretend like it's okay? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Oh, well, we can do the best two times. We can all make deep cuts. <laughs> so, D, first of all, dt over ds is a number. So, we're looking at as an uh, absolute value, not a magnitude. So, this is one of the few things in here that's not a vector. That's going to be a scalar. So, we're looking at the absolute value. Don't know exactly why. I mean, they cancel because dt is on the bottom and the other dt is on the top. But I'm a little worried about bringing it past the absolute value and canceling it. Uh, but it does cancel, and this is what n is. So. So it just become a regular vector. True because I wrote it. It's derived in the book too. All right, so that's another definition, or another, uh, not the definition, but an alternative uh, formula for n right there. Okay, so let's go way back to where we started. We did all that so that we have a different version of n we're going to use right there. That was why we did all that work. So we're gonna take all that stuff plug it in there. So all you care about is probably the final version, which I'll write down I'll write down below. I'll write the form up here. So we're gonna have one function AT times N plus A N times n. <coughs> All right, so we'll write these functions on Monday. And basically all the uh, at is going to be is the coefficient in front of n, so that's basically at. And then an is the coefficient in front. Oh man, I messed that up. Should change the order around, but that should be a t. Wow. Not very good at the English letters today. A N N A T T. So that our first coefficient A N is going to be that number, and then A T is going to be that number. So there'll be two scalar functions that'll basically scale the acceleration and the velocity properly. Oh boy.